everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance member web meeting. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. And always, we thank you for your partnership. We are so happy to have with us today, Dr. Ned Sharpless, director of the National Cancer Institute at NIH. Dr. Sharpless has been the director of NCI since 2017, stepping in to serve as acting director of the FDA in 2019. Dr. Sharpless will be speaking about NCI's research priorities, his perspective on the potential role of ARPA-H, the impact of COVID-19, and I'm sure many other of the moment topics. So please type your questions into the Q&A box as we go along and we will pose as many of them as we can at the end of Dr. Sharpless's remarks. So welcome, doctor. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Great, uh, thank, thank you, you. Jenny. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for having me uh, again back to speak at Research America. Uh, Research America has been such a valued partner uh, in this uh, struggle of ours, this fight against diseases uh, that take a devastating toll on patients and families, and particularly diseases like cancer. And, and I think that Research America has really come through during the pandemic with important advocacy on behalf of the medical research uh, community uh, what, during what's really been a difficult time for uh, our community and our nation. Uh, nevertheless, while we have certainly, uh, I think, turned a corner in the pandemic and, and there is, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, it's clear that the long-term effects of uh, the pandemic on cancer care and cancer outcomes will, will linger for a while, and that's a topic I'll touch on. So I thought what I'd do today is, is show some slides about uh, topics that are really of interest at the NCI, uh, including, uh, you know, our ongoing research portfolio and the impact of the pandemic, uh, and uh, then a few other things that are exciting in cancer research and then close uh, with some time for questions. So, uh, you know, I, please, if there are things that have always puzzled you about the National Cancer Institute, uh, you know, it, now is the time to ask. So uh, as you're well aware that new administration is uh, highly focused on making progress against cancer. Thank you, next slide. And, uh, you know, th this is, um, uh, I think probably most of you have heard President Biden say uh, he intends to end cancer as we know it. And he's reiterated this remarks uh, last week in the joint session, joint remarks to Congress. And we um, are really uh, excited. The, I'd say the cancer community has, has been galvanized by this uh, you know, real focus on making progress in cancer and by the president's leadership. I think probably many of you are also aware that uh, the vice president has an interest in cancer. She started her career, uh, in her first job apparently was washing glassware in her mother's lab. Her mother was a cancer researcher. And uh, the first lady, actually, one of her first events, one of her first acts as first lady was to visit the NCI virtually, as shown here in the upper left, and sort of thank uh, the members of the National Cancer Institute for their work during the pandemic. And she and I went on a joint visit together to the Massey Cancer Center in Richmond to talk about uh, the great work happening there in cancer health disparities. So I, suffice it to say, this is an administration that is fully engaged and committed to making progress uh, against cancer research. And uh, as I said, that's very exciting for our field. And the other, I think, probably good piece of news here is that Congress remains, in a bipartisan way, very supportive of cancer research and has been a strong proponent of uh, funding for cancer research and more support for cancer research for my entire time at the National Cancer Institute. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's an exciting moment uh, in our field. Next slide, please. And just to show you uh, that remark again, uh, this is um, uh, another statement of the presidential commitment. And, and maybe to make it clear where we are, sort of the cancer mortality in the United States has really been declining since the age adjusted mortality has been declining since the 1990s. So uh, early 1990s, you know, going down about one and a half percent per year for a couple of decades. And now in recent years, that trend has accelerated. So we've seen more steep declines in cancer mortality in the last few years. 2.5% uh, nearly in the uh, last year for which we have statistics. So uh, that's a great story. Uh, now against that long-standing trend, we have the pandemic, which is going to mess things up, and I'll talk about that shortly. But also we um, think that, you know, to, to meet a goal of like ending cancers, we know it, we'd really have to accelerate that rate of decline even further. So we've talked about, you know, if we could get to a rate of decline that is, I think, achievable, something like 4% per year, then that would get us to uh, a halving of peak mortality. So reducing you know, cancer deaths from the peak in 1990 to half that level by say an area of a time of like 2026, so five years from now. So a very tall order, but 
but I think based on what's going on in cancer research, that is uh, doable. And that's uh, something that, you know, the kind of goal we should have and, and, and we're taking action toward that goal now. Uh, next slide. So one aspect of that work and the stuff we're funding the National Cancer Institute is through the Cancer Moonshot. And I think many of you are probably familiar with this initiative. As you will recall, this was a major priority of then Vice President Biden during the Obama administration. It led to the allocation uh, of seven years of funding starting in FY fiscal year 2017 uh, to the National Cancer Institute. And this is $1.8 billion of funding to support the Moonshot over seven years. So we're a little more than halfway into this now. We've just started the fifth year of the cancer moonshot. And I think now we're starting to see already the impressive effects of this new program. And so, you know, some of the statistics are shown here. This has led to, you know, sort of 240 new projects uh, of research uh, across the cancer research continuum. For those of you who are interested in more detail on the moonshot, there's extensive information on this program on our website, cancer.gov. There's a whole moonshot section that talks about all of these initiatives and all of these areas of, of, of focus. But suffice it to say, it's projects you know, that, that look at the fundamental drivers of childhood cancer. It's research that aims to improve genetic counseling uh, to patients with inherited predisposition cancer. It has novel ways to engage communities. It has new ways to take on cancer health disparities. It has a, a big focus on new uh, technologies and new ways of using data. So it's really a, a wide variety of, 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 of translational cancer research that I think is very exciting. Some of these projects will take years to play out, but I think you know, the progress thus far has been really uh, remarkable. And we are seeing um, uh, you know, now some of these projects start to lead to clinical trials and stories and, 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 and publications. And so I think it's uh, you know, a good time to take stock on the, uh, on the effort. This week, uh, the journal Cancer Cell is publishing a commentary by myself and uh, my colleague, Dina Singer, to highlight some of the moonshot accomplishments thus far. So I think, you know, uh, as I said, uh, an important uh, area of uh, work. And uh, now as it starts to transition down, we're, we're about to finish the last two years of funding. It's time to talk about, you know, how to transition the, the infrastructure we've supported with the Moonshot to onto the new and next things the NCI will be doing. Uh, next slide, please. I thought I'd say a little bit about the pandemic. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has been important to the National Cancer Institute in two ways. Uh, First off, we have tried to keep the mission of cancer research and cancer care uh, and clinical care for cancer patients alive uh, during the disruptive effects of the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about what that's meant. But in addition to that, we've actually been asked to take on a lot of new research uh, for the benefit of the uh, public health. So the NCI uh, has many special capabilities in terms of research expertise uh, that were uh, valuable to uh, coronavirus research. So for example, the NCI has a long history of virology research and has a particular expertise in the area of serology, which is measuring an antibody response to a, a viral infection. And that, that's because of our work in you know, cancer-causing viruses like human papillomavirus. So it was relatively straightforward early in the pandemic to pivot some of our ongoing cancer virus activities to coronavirus activities. And this was done at the request of Congress who actually appropriated $306 million of supplemental funding to the NCI to take on this pandemic work. I wanna be clear, we did, in, no, in no case did we use cancer monies for coronavirus research. We were given additional funds for that. So we really had to sort of do both. We had to do our day job of being cancer researchers and try and you know, keep the cancer research enterprise going during the pandemic while also taking on these uh, COVID activities. And this is a very, uh, I think, successful and exciting portfolio of research some of which I've shown here. So on the left is this serologic sciences network that it funds 25 academic institutions to do kind of the foundational immunobiology of uh, the, the response to coronavirus infection. There's some translational and clinical trials, a, a large study, for example, of patients with cancer who get coronavirus infection, uh, clinical trials of agents like tocilizumab that is shown at the bottom there. There have been some new um, uh, work to support uh, the cancer research enterprise. We've done research like how does telehealth get incorporated in, into, into care for patients, including care, care patients with cancer. And then we've done some other sort of public health related uh, activities. It's too much to talk about today, but suffice it to say, it's kept us very busy. I will mention a few examples of this portfolio. So next slide, please. So, so one is this study called NCAPS, which stands for the NCI COVID and Cancer Patient Study. It's a study that we rapidly designed in, in six weeks. I think this is the fastest clinical trial we've ever designed at the National Cancer Institute. We opened it at 1,000 sites nationally using our existing cancer networks, the NCORE network. 
And to date, we've enrolled more than 1,000 patients on the trial. And the idea is this is to study patients who have a history of cancer, they're cancer survivors, or their ongoing active treatment for cancer, uh, and then they get coronavirus infection. And the idea is, is does uh, things about being a cancer patient, frailty, immunocompromised, things like that, uh, translate into worsen or different outcomes for patients with coronavirus? And it's now active, as I said, at many, many um, uh, sites nationally throughout the country. Uh, and I think this trial also will really become very, very important for studying uh, the issue of long COVID, you know, the long-term sequelae of coronavirus infection in a population such as this as well. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, 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 the impact on cancer screening and cancer diagnosis. So early in the pandemic, uh, we appreciated that we were uh, seeing dramatic changes in how cancer care was delivered nationally. And I actually asked our modeling network at the NCI, so-called CISNET, which is a group that, of intramural and extramural investigators who uh, have good models of cancer. I asked them what, what was going to happen. You know, if, if lots of people stopped going to the doctor, if they stopped getting screening for cancer, if they stopped getting care for cancer, and if their diagnosis of cancer were delayed, uh, what would be the impact of that? And so we, we published a paper in Science and about you know like May of last year, predicting excess mortality, we, we suspected that these declines in cancer care and cancer diagnosis would translate into about ten thousand extra deaths from breast cancer and colon cancer over the next ten years. And we only did the analysis for breast and colon cancer because those were the two diseases where we have the best models, where they're very sophisticated and, and validated. And so we felt like we could be very confident in our predictions for those models. And to do that exercise, we had to do some predictions. We had to make some estimates of how badly we thought cancer care was going to be affected in the United States. And so, for example, one of the things we, we said, well, maybe screening will be disrupted. I don't know, something really bad, 70%. Maybe, maybe there'll be a 70% reduction in, say, cancer screening. And in retrospect, our assumptions were, if anything, too optimistic. The effect of uh, the pandemic on cancer care was even worse than we uh, predicted back then, you know, last spring and summer. So those data are shown here. These are data from our PROSPER network. And I'm showing here the, the results for mammography and for colonoscopy. The other main screening modalities in the United States are uh, cervical cancer screening, pap smears, and uh, lung cancer screening, low dose CT. The data for those look essentially identical. And what it shows is that there was pretty good screening going on nationally until uh, you know, March and April of last year and then it really fell off a cliff. And so we had a 95% reduction of say mammography. Now using other data that we're starting to see that we have you know, access to electronic health record data and you know, claims data from Medicare and CMS, uh, we have seen a recovery of many of these screening modalities over the, you know, since May, things have picked back up. Mammography, for example, is almost back to its full level pre-pandemic, but other areas of cancer screening are, are more delayed and they're coming back. I think it's also interesting to look at the colon cancer data here on the right. You see it's a lot of different lines. And you see one of those lines is not as affected as badly as the others. You know, most of them plummet, but one of them stays up a little higher. And that's for FIT screening. So that's a, 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 a fecal immunohistochemical testing that can be, in some cases, done at home. So I think that gives a, 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 an opportunity. It shows that um, Screening where you have to go into a doctor's office, like mammography and colonoscopy, is going to be very hard during a pandemic. But screening that can involve self-collection of samples at home might be able to persist. And so this is a, a research question for the NCIs. You know, can we use technology to move some of the screening out of the clinic and into the patient's home? And uh, that was a trend that's been going on in cancer research for a while. And clearly, the pandemic is going to accelerate. But accelerate that trend. But back to the observation here. We believe now on the order of say 10 million cancer screening events were missed in uh, 2020 and early 21. And uh, we, the United States did not have the capacity to kind of make that up. So we, we think that those events are just going to in many cases lead to delayed diagnosis and patients are gonna come in with cancer at later stage and presumably that will lead to some worsened outcome. And that's why we predict some excess mortality uh, from these delayed diagnosis issues. And it's not, by the way, solely screening. We also know diagnoses of cancers that are not screened for, say pancreatic cancer. Those are also were decreased during the pandemic, presumably because patients weren't going to doctors for symptomatic evaluation. So diagnosis is being delayed for lots of reasons, including decreased screening. Uh, and we think that that will lead to these worsened outcomes. So, so now 
the real challenge for the NCI and for the cancer community at large is what to do about this. You know, how can we make up uh, you know, for this uh, delay in staging and this increased uh, you know, advanced disease that we expect to see? And uh, this is a, an intense area of conversation and focus now. And, and we believe this is really requires a collective call to action across the cancer community involving the caregivers and the patients and the advocates and the payers in many instances. And we all need to collectively try and you know, address this problem head on and make sure that this is, we, we minimize the impact of uh, the pandemic on our patients so that we're not really changing one public health emergency, the pandemic for another public health emergency, you know, excess cancer death. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I thought I'd close by uh, mentioning that um, it's a very important anniversary uh, here at the National Cancer Institute this year. So uh, 2021 is the 50th anniversary this December for um, the uh, National uh, Cancer Act. And I think most of you are familiar with the National Cancer Act. I, I think we have all seen those you know, black and white photos of Mary Lasker and you know, Richard Nixon signed in the, the document. And, and, and you know, at that time, the vision was that uh, the United States was gonna make tremendous progress against cancer rapidly because of the infrastructure and funding provided by the National Cancer Act. Cancer has turned out to be a harder problem than I think anybody envisioned in 1971. And it's taken us, I think, longer to make the kind of progress that was expected back then. But we are now getting there. You know, I think with five decades of understanding of the biology of cancer, we're starting to see those decreases in morbid morbidity and mortality that I alluded to, this phenomenal explosion of new ideas in cancer that's led to something like you know, 70 new medicines for cancer, 200 new approvals from the FDA over the last sort of three or four years. So, you know, lots of new ideas, lots of new therapies, new ways to prevent and screen for cancer, new medical devices, you know, a, a very exciting time in our field. And I do believe that the present era will become to look, look, to be looked upon as a golden age of cancer research when we really started to make these rapid progress in cancer research because of those decades of basic investigation that set the groundwork to uh, make this rapid progress. So we think that this uh, National Cancer Act 50th anniversary is important one to commemorate. We're not using the word celebrate because we can't celebrate uh, our progress yet. We still have 600,000 Americans in, 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 die of cancer every year. It's still the second leading cause of death in the United States. It's the leading cause of death for you know, younger adults. And uh, we still have a lot of progress to go. But I think the uh, signs are good. Progress has really picked up. And uh, we, we believe that uh, we can make uh, a tremendous uh, advances in the next few years uh, as we sort of, uh, you know, incorporate all these new ideas into therapy. And so really it's time to talk about what we've accomplished in the last 50 years and what we uh, plan to do going forward and how we plan to make progress for patients. And one of the things we really hope is that other stakeholders, anyone interested in the topic of biomedical research or cancer uh, outcomes, will join us in this commemoration that we, we, you know, you can see all of these materials that we've been used for marketing are not branded, they're not NCI specific. We hope that everyone who wants to talk about the National Cancer Act will, you know, use these common materials we've provided so that we can jointly all explain to the American public and to Congress why research in cancer, why investment in cancer research has been so important and so successful, but why we need to do more of it. And so with that, I will close and hopefully there'll be some questions. And I wanna again, thank Research America for having me back to speak. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. I mean, so much to say in a short period of time, but um, you did it quite well. Um, so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Um, we, you know, those of us in the research advocacy space were very um, uh, proud, you know, to comment on the fact that the mRNA um, and the adenovirus technologies were decades in the making right before they were used in the vaccine. What are some of the technologies that are at NCI now that have really been decades in the making and you're, you're really feeling um, optimistic about in terms of what they may be able to deliver? Well, well, one of them is definitely mRNA. I mean, I think that's good for us too. So the, the prospect of you know, bespoke, highly personalized cancer vaccines is very exciting. Some of you may know Moderna was almost a cancer company before it was a vaccine company. And mm -hmm. hopefully someday it'll become a cancer company again, because I think that platform is really exciting. You know, the, the, the founder of Moderna, Derek Rossi, is a, you know, a, a, you know, was a longstanding uh, person who's been interested in cancer biology, for example, an old friend. But I think also um, we're now seeing this explosion of cellular-based therapies. And this is this idea where he 
take your own lymphocytes and sort of soup them up ex vivo. And this sounds like science fiction, but then, then we re-inject them and it works. You know, we can turn your own cells into little cancer fighting machines. And, uh, you know, we're now able to cure, you know, really cure like the big C word, um, certain kinds of lymphoma and other hematologic malignancies. So the challenge there is how to figure out to get that to work, you know, in, in, in a broader group of cancer patients, say diseases like pancreatic cancer and, and brain cancer, which we haven't figured that out yet. There's a, a really interesting area going on in medicinal chemistry. There's these new ways of making small molecules to hit cancer targets. Then these things like molecular glues and protax, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weedy, uh, you know, basic science topic, but those things are now starting to pay off. So it's been sort of decades of medicinal chemistry of how to make molecules that are better at gauging their target. They're better at getting into cells. They're better at killing off the target they want to, they want to work on. And they're really tailor-made for cancer. You know, they're, they're very useful to get these, you know, mutated proteins that cause cancer like KRAS, for example. And, you know, that's been an idea we've had since 1970, but it's now like hitting the clinic in 2021. So that I think is a is tremendously exciting area. And then lastly, you know, since maybe 2010, we've had this explosion in the field of immuno-oncology and how to, you know, make the patient's own immune system recognize the cancer and fight it. And, and that uh, has been very successful in diseases like melanoma and certain kinds of lung cancer. Again, the challenge is there is how to make that, you know, it, it works in like 20% of patients. How do we make it work in 80% of patients? And so there's a lot of ideas about how to mix and match the various therapies we have to, uh, you know, engage uh, uh, fully against cancer. So those are like the therapeutic exciting areas. There's one other area I really wanted to mention, which is in a, in a diagnostic, you know, screening area, which is this idea of, of, uh, of uh, these multi-cancer detector tests where you do a blood draw on someone. So you, you, this is the idea is you'd be a healthy person. You would go in to see your doctor when you're 50 plus years old and it would be part of your annual or, or every other year screening, you would have a blood test that would sample your blood for markers of like 50 different kinds of cancer. So instead of getting screened just for breast cancer with mammography or cervical cancer with a pap smear, a patient would get screened for you know, 30, 40, 50 kinds of cancer at once. And we believe if those technologies work the way we think they can, they have the potential to dramatically reduce cancer mortality in the United States. So all of those ideas are exciting and require further study. It's not clear any of them are really going to work more than they work today. That's why we need uh, both the work of the National Cancer Institute and the significant investment from industry that we are benefiting from at the present time. Terrific. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Terry. Uh, I see uh, several questions related to ARPA-H. Um, so uh, Terry, do you want to Yes, thanks, Jenny. And uh, again, folks, you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, as I'm sure most people on this call have heard, the president has uh, been talking about something he's calling a DARPA-like uh, agency, uh, maybe called HARPA or ARPA-H. Um, and he's mentioned cancer specifically as part of that. Uh, do, you have, what, do you have, what have you heard? What can you tell us? Will NCI be involved? Sure, obviously an area of tremendous interest in National Cancer Institute if there's going to be a, you know, a new agency working on cancer. So, so we have followed this closely. Uh, I think the, the, what we really know about ARPA-H to date is what's in the president's uh, budget, you know, the, the, the so-called you know, the, the skinny budget. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, the president has said many times that he would like to intimately involve Eric Lander, who recently had his Senate hearing and is awaiting confirmation. So Eric, for those of you who don't know, Eric is a, uh, a terrific American scientist. He's a real leader in genomics. He's a former mathematician and business guy and now, uh, you know, director of the Broad. Uh, the Broad Institute in, at MIT is, uh, you know, a, a great partner for cancer research for the National Cancer Institute. So, we, you know, he's well known to the NCI in cancer research. And I think to have a scientist of that quality at the cabinet level now in a cabinet position, uh, advising the president on new initiatives like, uh, you know, the ARPA-H initiative is very good news for you know patients with cancer because I think that's a that's a that that is someone who can provide very great vis vision for this project. Obviously, you know we've spoken a lot to uh, Eric and and Francis Collins uh, about uh, their ideas here, and so I think um, you know this is still something that's evolving because now uh, I think Congress has to pick up and act based on the president's suggestion. As you as you know in the president's budget, he suggested some funding for the NIH to do its classical NIH stuff because what the NIH does is good but also some new funding for ARPA-H to do uh, new things. And, and, and I would say it's, it's, it's impossible for the NCI to predict what's going to happen here. Who knows how Congress will take this and, uh, you know, but I, I think the, the vision of additional support for cancer research, new resources for cancer research 
particularly with some new capabilities to maybe do things a little nimbly or more different, you know, that some of the DARPA-like capabilities is potentially very exciting because, you know, there, there are things the National Cancer Institute would like to do that are just not a great fit for what we can do for a variety of reasons. And, 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 and so uh, either it's not enough money or, you know, a process that may take a while or, or a variety of things. So I, I think, you know, it's very exciting to have the opportunity to uh, talk about initiatives that would, you know, think differently and, 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 and be funded from a different source. So, uh, you know, the, the president's budget had suggested this would be a feature of the NIH, and uh, that, that, that seems reasonable to me. I, you know, the N NCI and the NIH work closely together. We're part of the NIH. So, um, but we'll have to see. I, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, still uh, uh, a bit of an unknown as to how Congress is going to go forward with this. But uh, so I, the one thing I will say that's very clear is this has been, you know, just a jolt of electricity, the cancer research community. I mean, I... Everybody's calling me and asking me what's going to happen, and you know, and so uh, you know, I, I think that it has caused tremendous excitement uh, for cancer research, the way the moonshot did, you know, back when that was announced. So uh, it's reminiscent of that period. Dr. Sharpless, are there lessons that you and your colleagues will be taking either into the the traditional NCI framework or into an an, an ARPA H? that really come from the COVID-19 experience of you know, accelerating discovery and development? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the, uh, one important lesson not to miss about the coronavirus pandemic is that if, uh, you know, $17 billion of government support will work, right? I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, I, I hope that people realize one of the important lessons is that resources matter, is that, you know, if, if the government says it's a priority and puts significant funding behind it, things will move. But that, you know, $17 billion is a lot of money, right? So uh, that, that if you really want to make progress in some of these intractable biomedical problems, new investment is key. I would say another thing that I think has been very interesting about the um, pandemic that, you know, would be a lesson worth remembering is the, uh, the way it has forced government to work together across agencies. So we've had very detailed interactions with the FDA. We were testing medical devices for them up at Frederick National Lab. You know, Jeff Shuren uh, wrote this editorial, the, the leader at CDRH, the FDA, about how this is sort of the first time the federal government has done, you know, proficiency testing for itself in a different part of the federal government. It worked really well. I don't think we would have ever thought about doing something like that, but the pandemic forced us to do that. So there's been these interactions across government that have been fascinating that I think have been good for the public health. Uh, you know, CDC, FDA, NIST, Sparta, you know, we, we've had a, a range of these interactions, and that's true for the entire NIH, not just the NCI. So I think that is a, a lesson worth remembering. I think also uh, this uh, the success of the mRNA vaccines, I think, has really pointed to something we were starting to believe in cancer as well, which is platform technologies are very valuable, right? So the idea that, you know, th these mRNA vaccines can be rapidly repurposed and, you know, for a new mutant or a new variant or something is not dissimilar from, you know, changing the uh, cancer vaccine slightly for a different patient with a different KRAS mutation. So that's the, the uh, utility of platform technologies, I think, is, is a really um, important area for future biomedical research, particularly cancer research, although there are some regulatory issues that we need to solve. So uh, the regulation of those types of drugs and devices is not straightforward. And, and, and you know, as a, as a former uh, as a, a longstanding fan of the FDA, I think there's some things we're going to have to figure out to make that as successful as we would like. And, and maybe, you know, it's also, I, I think the pandemic has really forced us to look at some things and how we do clinical trials and medicine uh, during the pandemic that have been very, very enlightening. So, for example, one of the things we did at the NCI when the pandemic started is we appreciated patients were not going to want to go to the doctor <laughs> for regular visits because, you know, every, it was scary. And so, uh, but we wanted them to stay on their clinical trial and the clinical trial required a doctor's visit. So what do you do? So we uh, worked to allow patients to go somewhere closer to home so they wouldn't have to drive a long period. In some cases, we, we said, it's, it's silly for you to come into a hospital pharmacy and pick up the medicine. We'll allow the medicine to be shipped to your home. So usually we wouldn't allow an experimental medicine to be shipped, but we changed that rule. And like one of the most obvious was we were consenting people. You know, when you go on your clinical trial, that would have to be done in person. And we said, well, maybe you can do that over the phone. You know, maybe you can do that by Zoom chat. So I think we learned a lot of things about clinical trials accrual. And, and now we've polled both the trialists and the patients, and these are wildly popular. All of those changes were things that were great. Nobody likes coming in for consent in person. There's, you know, all these things we've learned that we can do during the pandemic safely are things that I think we're going to continue doing. 
That's also true for a lot of issues around care. So, you know, uh, as you may know, the payers waived a lot of these rules about telehealth and, you know, taking care of patients across state lines and things like that. And they've been very, very popular. And I think telehealth really has a, a chance to, you know, get at a very intractable problem in cancer research of how do we provide access to patients who may be geographically or in a community that doesn't, you know, uh, have a lot of doctors around. And so, you know, the, the fact that we can do telehealth so successfully I think is, is good news for cancer research. And we need to remember what we learned during the pandemic because we were forced to do telehealth, but you know, use that as a tool to then enhance access and maybe get at the intractable problem of cancer health disparities in the United States now. So, so I think those are a few examples of, of really important learnings from the pandemic that I hope will continue to go on. Very, very helpful. Uh, Terry, I think we have time for one more question. And I believe we've, we've got one. Yes. Um, regarding uh, the 4% per year reduction in cancer rates, can we get there without addressing these so-called recalcitrant cancers, um, some of which are still increasing? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I, I don't think the answer, the answer is I don't think we can. I mean, I, we will have to make progress against things like pancreatic cancer and these more intractable forms of lung cancer and these emerging diseases um, you know, like cold, liver cancers increase in the United States uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and you know, to, to get to the, the real reductions, you know, we have great stories going on and, you know, the majority of lung cancer and melanoma, uh, we need to have great stories going on in those other cancer types too, because, you know, there's, there's lots of different types of cancer and, and some of those are quite significant. I guess the good news there is that, um, you know, when I was a fellow, when I started out in this business and say, you know, like the 1990s, uh, the worst cancers imaginable were melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. I mean, I, I thought we would never see progress. We had no good ideas. We had no hope. There was nothing was ever going to work against those diseases. Melanoma in particular was like just notorious for not responding to any therapy and radiation and, and was a particularly aggravating disease to take care of as an oncologist because all of our patients did poorly despite you know, Herculean efforts. And, and now... Uh, we cure, cure, make, go away. We make their cancer go away and not come back. The majority of patients with metastatic melanoma in the United States, including patients with, met with brain metastasis and really bad kinds of melanoma, like Jimmy Carter, right? I mean, so, you know, curing melanoma for most patients, we still have patients who don't respond to therapy and we have to figure out how to fix that. But that's, the odds are, if you have metastatic melanoma in the United States, you're going to get cured. And that's also starting to see that in lung cancer, you know, a disease where we had very little hope for many, many years and now we're seeing progress. So while pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma look pretty bad today, I they don't look any worse than melanoma looked in you know 2010. So I, I think we can, and when that progress happens, it can be very, very fast. So I'm waiting for that good idea. And, 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 and you know, the, the thing about the NCI right now is it's, we have lots of ideas. We have, you know, literally hundreds of things might work that are all being tested at once. So it's hard to say what that thing is going to be, but I, I'm hopeful that in the bin of emerging technologies, of which I mentioned a few, you know, Protax and cellular immunotherapy and new diagnostic techniques like the multi-cancer detector panel, you know, something in one of those might be a, a way to make progress against these so-called intractable cancers as well. Thank you, Dr. Sharpless. You know, the melanoma example you gave fits very well into a construct we use, our, our CEO, Mary Willie, and those of us who give presentations, which is then now imagine. So, you know, I don't need to explain what, what that means, but it's one of the ways that we work with science and other advocates to explain the, the value of uh, you know, um, investing in basic research. And the story that you've just shared about melanoma is, is a really great example of that. Thank you so much. I mean, you really covered a lot of ground, a lot of important issues, um, some depressing, some very hopeful, uh, but a very lightening um, uh, 30 minutes. So thank you, Dr. Sharpless. We really appreciate your leadership and everything that NCI does every single day. Well, I want to thank you for having me again. It's so great to come back and speak to this group. And uh, I really value this partnership and the work you're doing on behalf of patients uh, with all diseases, including cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Bye-bye. So a, a couple of quick announcements before we lose folks. Um, Let's see, this coming Monday, May 10th at one, we will have uh, Jennifer Kama with the House Labor Age Approves Committee. She'll join us for an off the record conversation on Chairwoman Deloro's priorities for the subcommittee. 
FY21 approves and prospects for supplemental funding. And I'm sure you have seen um, the exciting announcement about the 2021 Advocacy Awards, which are also happening next week, next Thursday. Uh, in addition to honoring many, many outstanding individuals, many of which you've heard from uh, and heard about, um, we also will be um, sharing an interview that Oprah Winfrey did with Dr. Fauci. And we'll also have welcome remarks from NBC anchor Lester Holt. It's really going to be quite um, a program and uh, you can register now. There's a link in the chat uh, and we hope you will join us. So with that, uh, we hope to see you on Monday and Thursday and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much.